Hello, I'm Alison Young and this is another in the series of looking at controversial cases as part of the Constitutional Law Matters project. And the case I'm going to be looking at today is a case called Privacy International. So the first thing we need to ask ourselves is why is this case so important? Well, the reason the case is so important is because it involves something we call an ouster clause. And an ouster clause is a specific provision in legislation that tries to remove the ability of judicial review over a decision of the executive. Now, this causes problems because we see this classic argument that we find in the UK Constitution a lot about the balance between the rule of law and parliamentary sovereignty. So when you're looking at an ouster clause from the perspective of the rule of law, it's easy to see why this is problematic. The rule of law is all about ensuring that executive bodies have proper legal powers for their actions. And one important way of making sure that is the case is ensuring we have good legal checks. So if you come along with an ouster clause, you're removing a legal check or potentially removing a legal check over an administrative body. So that is going to undermine the extent to which we uphold the rule of law because you might be removing an important layer of accountability. But if you look at it from the viewpoint of parliamentary sovereignty, parliamentary sovereignty is all about seeing legislation as the highest form of law in the land, about upholding the will of parliament, which in turn upholds the will of the electorate. If parliament has said in very clear legislation that judicial review is meant to be removed and the courts say, well, actually, we're not going to uphold that clause, then that will undermine parliamentary sovereignty. The rule of law will be undermined undermining democratic will. And as with all things in the UK Constitution, what is key is always the context. So we have to think very carefully about what is the type of ouster clause in play, because different ouster clauses might be justified in different situations. So having set out this background, what was going on in Privacy International? Well, this is all about a series of decisions where GCHQ, which carries out all sorts of surveillance activities, particularly with regard to protecting national security had been applying for a series of thematic warrants to get electronic surveillance. So what do we mean by that? Well, normally, if you wanted a warrant for electronic surveillance, you would have a particular individual in mind or a particular location. So let's say you suspected me of terrorist activities, then you might get a warrant that puts out my name to survey electronic surveillance to do with me, and maybe sets out my office here in Robinson College as somewhere where you want to survey communications. A thematic warrant would suggest that rather than it being a particular individual or a particular premise, we're thinking about a particular investigation or a particular area you want to investigate. And as you investigate that particular offence or these particular activities, you start adding different individuals and different premises to that warrant rather than having to constantly apply for specific warrants. And Privacy International was a pressure group that was concerned about the extent to which GCHQ was was receiving these thematic warrants. And so it brought a particular challenge to a decision of the Investigative Powers Tribunal that had concluded that these thematic warrants were lawful. But it had a problem. And the reason Privacy International had a problem was because we had an ouster clause. So the issue that arose was whether this clause that removed judicial review over the decisions of the Investigatory Powers Tribunal, the IPT, was lawful or not. And... In order to understand this, we have to go back and look at other ouster clauses. And there's a very famous case in English administrative law called Annis Minnick. And what this shows is that courts are very reluctant to grant ouster clauses, to allow clauses to remove judicial review. And you can understand why, because they want to protect the rule of law. And what we found in Annis Minnick was a very specific ouster clause, which I've put on the slide for you. And this said that determinations of the Foreign Compensation Commission couldn't be called in any court of law. And what the court did was it said, well, I know this is removing judicial review because we cannot question your determinations, but we have to know that it is a determination. And there are some errors that you will make, which will mean that although you think you made a determination, you actually didn't. 
What kind of errors are they? Well, these are what we call jurisdictional errors. So these are errors as to whether the body had the power to act or not. So what the court said in Annis Minnick is you might say you can't question determinations, but we can question purported determinations. Those determinations tainted by this idea of a jurisdictional error, because in essence, that isn't a determination at all. And what happened in subsequent case law was that the courts understood using anismic and in future cases that all legal errors, so when an executive body makes a mistake as to the law, are jurisdictional. They will be deemed to be mistakes as to whether they had the power to act or not. So we know that courts don't like ouster clauses. But this ouster clause was drafted in a very specific way because it didn't just say you can't question them in a court of law. It had this extra element in brackets, which again I've put on the slide for you. And this legislation said even those determinations about whether you have the jurisdiction or not, so including those jurisdictional errors, cannot be questioned. So you can understand why this causes balance and this problem for rule of law and parliamentary sovereignty, because the rule of law would suggest you should be able to review these decisions. But Parliament has said clearly, even those decisions you make as to whether you should have the power to act or not cannot be questioned by the court. So Parliament seemed to be sending a clear message. This ouster clause will succeed. You can't sort of interpret your way out of this clause because we've included those kinds of jurisdictional errors that might lead the court to say, well, this wasn't really a decision or a determination in the first place. So that's the context. But what did the Supreme Court decide? And this is one of these horrible cases that you get to read when you're an undergraduate, when there's all sorts of different opinions in the judgment. So I'll try my best to summarize the difference between the majority and the minority, which is even more complicated because both the majority and the minority had different components to it. So the majority, so four out of the seven judges, concluded that this ouster clause would not succeed. Why not? Well, that's because for three of the four, there was a general presumption against all ouster clauses. The one of the fours said this general presumption didn't apply when you're dealing with ouster clauses, removing judicial review over decisions of bodies that are like courts or taking court-like decisions and composed like courts, rather like the IPT. Why do we have this general presumption? Because of the rule of law. So courts will generally read these clauses very, very narrowly. So how do they read down this particular clause that said even jurisdictional errors cannot be questioned in a court of law? Well, the court said this wording is not clear enough. The majority concluded that although this was removing jurisdictional errors, it wasn't removing errors of law. And you might think, well, how did it reach that conclusion if all legal errors are jurisdictional errors? Well, it's recognising that just because all legal errors are jurisdictional doesn't mean that all jurisdictional errors are legal errors. There are other types of jurisdictional errors. So we could read this clause as saying, well, we will remove judicial review for jurisdictional errors of fact, but this isn't really clear enough to remove judicial review for errors of law because of the importance of ensuring we have this legal check to uphold the rule of law. And Lord Carnworth, giving the main judgment for the three out of the four in the majority, also made a statement in dicta, so this is something that is not binding, that the rule of law means that it is impossible for Parliament to remove judicial review for excess or abuse of jurisdiction or for an error of law. So that was the majority. What about the minority? Well, again, the minority split. And one judge in the minority decided that the ouster clause did remove judicial review for jurisdictional errors of law in this case. The other two within the minority also concluded that it would remove judicial review for jurisdictional errors of law, but only for very, very um, sort of general element, but there's still a narrow element of errors of law where you wouldn't remove judicial review. And they drew this odd distinction between substantive errors of law and these kind of niggly procedural 
points. So the idea, said the minority, was that the IPT was meant to make final determinations over the substance of the law. And that's what the ouster clause was bringing in. You couldn't have judicial review for substantive legal errors. But if you made a mistake, something like, was the court properly composed or not? That's a different kind of error of law. And there could be judicial review over those specific procedural errors. And Lord Wilson... Um, who was the, the single judge in one of the minority judgments, also made an obitus statement that he partially agreed with Lord Carnworth that it shouldn't be possible for Parliament to remove judicial review for excess or abuse of jurisdiction. So that's the best I can do to try and summarise it. Why is it people think this case is problematic? Well, it's partly because it's seen as a strong way of protecting the rule of law, particularly when we look at this balance against parliamentary sovereignty. Did the court sort of creatively interpret these words in order to get around an ouster clause? Were they prioritising rule of law too much when contrasted against the will of Parliament? Well, I can see why some people might make that point. But I think we need to read the judgment quite carefully and think very carefully about this importance of context again. So yes, this was a tribunal performing a judicial function. And for the most part, it was carrying out very specialist areas of the law, looking at security decisions. But there was a concern of the majority that you might have this bizarre system of islands of law. What if you had a specialist tribunal that was deciding legal issues, interpreting legislation that didn't just apply in this tribunal, but applied elsewhere as well? Surely we need an element of judicial review to make sure that much as that we can have these specialist decisions, we don't end up with odd islands of law where the same legal provisions means different things in different tribunals. And so there's a need for judicial review and there's a need not to remove it in these circumstances. The other reason the case gets criticised is because of these strong statements that there might be some things that Parliament just cannot do, that it could not remove judicial review for either excess or abuse of jurisdiction, for when a body takes a decision when it didn't have the power to act, or if you're Lord Carnworth, for an error of law in order to ensure that there's legal validity. And again, these are strong statements, but you have to recognise this is dicta. And really, in a sense, what the court is doing here is making a strong point about how important the rule of law is and how in our constitution, if we do have a system of parliamentary sovereignty, it relies on other background constitutional principles in order to ensure its true legitimacy. And one of those includes the ability of having judicial review and making sure we have the rule of law particularly that we don't remove the ability of the courts to check that the executives have the lawful ability to act. So I can understand why people see this as controversial and there are strong statements. And I have to admit, sometimes I read the dicta of Lord Carmouth and think, do I really believe this? Do I think that the court should not enforce these provisions? So it is a difficult case, one that can be difficult to understand and is controversial, but I think it's trying to perform a good constitutional role of making sure we have a good balance of power between the different institutions of the Constitution.